glorious evening. Woohoo! Woohoo! It is a pretty day today, huh? I wish I could have enjoyed it more. <laughs> ah. But we will this weekend, right? All right. <coughs> if y'all want to go ahead and stand. All right. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to come together in person and get in unity together and worship you, Father. We are so thankful for your love, for your grace and your mercy that will follow us all the days of our lives. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity to praise you freely and worship you. Let your praises always be on our lips, Lord. We thank you for everything that you've blessed us with. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Miss Carolyn said we're going to do the lip songs tonight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see if you can pick up on that.
devoted like a rain of solid gold like a vow that is tested like a covenant of old your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon with mercy for today faithful you have been faithful you will be pledge yourself to me and that's why i sing your praise with ever beyond my lips ever beyond my lips your praises ever beyond my lips ever beyond my lips your praises ever beyond my lips ever beyond my lips your praises ever beyond my lips ever doing good everybody excited yeah everybody expecting to come and get something on Wednesday night you know I love that uh, I remember when we first 
begin to serve the Lord and uh, and really begin to go to church. And it amazed me, um, and this isn't against people that are busy and can't come on Wednesdays, but it amazed me the amount of people that, it, it, and a lot of people are self-feeders, keep in mind, right? But it amazed me the amount of people that think they can survive off one fill-up a week. And and I and I for myself, if there were ten, it wouldn't be enough. You know, it's the truth because because life comes at you, and like we talked about Sunday, is everybody has a plan until what? Until you get punched in the mouth, until those circumstances come. And so, having something in place to be able to continue to to build you up and to keep you uh, keep you on course during the week. So I know for myself that a lot of my growth and a lot of my stability comes when I get when I continually am filled up and not just not just once a week or not not even just twice a week I can tell you that that if we just came Sunday and Wednesday it wouldn't be enough but but taking time to stay in his presence and to to just be reminded how amazing he is you know something that uh, the younger I get I remember is there's no circumstance too big for God there's really no circumstances too big for him. So as you're navigating life, just to remember. But I, I was reminded tonight as, as, as we were during, during worship in Deuteronomy. And, uh, and I want to read. He says, they shall be my people and I will be their God. And then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children and them. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And I will not turn away from doing them, doing them good but I will put my fears in their heart so that they will not depart from me. I love that because there was, a, there was a combination of two things. I mean, there's so many times in our circumstances we're like, you know, God, you're, you know, you're my God, right? But there's a difference with say, just saying that you're my God than surrendering and being his people. You know what I mean? Because it was that two-way that said if this took place that he was going to put that covenant, he was going to cut that covenant that they were then going to be able to participate with. And that took place through Calvary. But it's no different in the area of surrender in your life to be able to receive the fullness of God. I'm telling you that if there's, you know, if for me personally, there's things that, that will creep up in my life or things that I'll see. And when the Holy Spirit will nudge me on them and I'll continue to suppress that, what I'll find is it's not that the, that the blessing of the Lord is not flowing because he's not holding anything back from me. But what I'll find is that you'll get a little bit of callous in that area. And what, what ultimately will happen is you won't feel that nudge and you won't be able to hear the voice of the Lord so clearly in that area. So, so I encourage you that it's not just, hey, he's my God and we love him. But man, I, I want him to know that, that we're his people that we're surrendered to him, that we want his plan in our life and that we were willing to surrender those things in our life that would keep us from it. Or, you know, it's not even, it's, it's not always even something particular in your life as much as it is sometimes just being so busy that you don't slow down to hear. And I think that's the hard thing is, is, is we navigate life and, 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 and life can be difficult. Life can be a battle. But the word says that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So sometimes I have to wonder how much of his yoke I'm walking in and how much of, the, of my wrestle is with the flesh and the cares of the world. Because according to his word, it doesn't line up. So there's times that we can easily slip over. You know, the, the word says if we walk in the spirit, that we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right? It doesn't say that, we, that we're just not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. It says that we walk in the Spirit. So if you're fulfilling the lust of the flesh, you can rest assured you're not walking in the Spirit in that area. You see what I'm saying? So it's a good way to recognize it. And, and for us and for me, if there's one thing that I want more and more in my life every single day, it's to know that I've given my best in this life. To know that I've done my very best, not for me, but for him. Oh, and by the way, when I give him my best, it's the best for me and for my family and for everybody else around us, Amen. right? So it's just recognizing we want to give our best. So, you know, just be encouraged tonight as we go into the word. There's a lot of stuff that's taking place in the world today. And like we talked about Sunday, it's uh, unfortunately, it's not going to stop. It's, it's not going to just be like, oh, tomorrow's going to be sunshine and roses and it's going to be great. and We're not going to have struggles anymore. That's not what's going to take place. 
when, when the things that we're dealing with now are over with, we're going to experience different things, and it's going it's to conti- continue to accelerate. And this is what the Word says. It says that the hearts of men will wax cold, right? The hearts of men will become harder and harder and harder. And how does that happen? Through exactly what I was saying, uh, just the hardening of the heart, that callous. Um, Pastor Scott was preaching Sunday. I shared his uh, service out from Sunday that he preached and I thought it was amazing. It was in the same vein of where we were, but he said it a different way, and I really liked the way that he said it. I'm like, well, geez, God, couldn't you give me that way to say it? <laughs> he said, I did. You're saying it right now. <laughs> but he says that uh, as believers, we're created to carry people in our heart. But when we get to where we carry issues in our heart, then we can't carry people. Right? We get we get so focused on carrying issues. And here's the here's the reason, because if I have an issue in my heart, that I'm dealing with, and I take a, a stand on a situation, and that's my issue, and that's what I'm carrying. And Mr. Greg takes a stand and has an issue in his heart that he takes, and it's a different side than I am, then all of a sudden he and I are at odds at each other. So I can't carry him in my heart like God intends for me to carry him. Right? So just be reminded that, that man, it's, we, don't, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. The people that we see and we hear are not the struggle. It's, it's the, the, the principalities and powers. That's what it is. It's the darkness that's coming against us. And I, I think sometimes we forget. And I was, I was talking to our kids the other day. I think it was all of us. We were driving. And I, I had mentioned that, uh, you know, I had mentioned to you guys before that I lost a sister when she was, when she was a baby. And that very thing that that the enemy came in to steal her life is one of the very things that rises up in me to help me to do hard things or difficult things today when they come up. Why? Because I made it in my own heart. I settled it every single day. I have breath in these lungs, which is going to be a long time. The enemy is going to pay for it. And every day, every day I wake up. He's going to be reminded that he should have never messed with our family. He should never mess with the, with the, with the children of God. He should never mess with the church of, with his church, with, with God's church, right? So just remember that as we navigate, you know, there's, there's going to be troubles. There's going to be tribulations. There's going to be struggles. But how you respond to them is solely up to you. Amen? All right. Are you guys about ready? Are you really, really ready? Are you really, really ready? Are you really ready? It's time to receive our tithes and offerings. I'm going to have Trent come up and demonstrate that for everybody. He squatted to rise and got cooked in the squat, as Pastor Tony would say. (laughs) All right, so if you have your your tithes and offerings, if you're online... Um, it should be on the screen for you to know how to give. You, if you've been given that way, then continue to do so. I know it works well. I know it's really convenient for a lot of people. So um, it's a great way to give. If you if you just want to want to give, then uh, you know in person while you're here. Then if you'll slip your hand up, if you need an envelope, then the, the, uh, Martin will hand one out to you. But we want to pray over that seed and listen. Don't. How many of you have made a deposit at a bank? And then went back later and withdrew the money. Why did you go withdraw it? Because you made a deposit. Here's the thing. You have a heavenly bank account that it says that the locust and the canker worm and, and all this stuff will not, be, will not be able to devour this. We're talking about a heavenly account. And I'm telling you, the increase on a heavenly account is it will blow your mind. It's better than any stock market you can find here. Right, so when you sow and you give, and you do it with a grateful heart and a thankful heart and a, and a joyful heart, just know this: God, I need to make a withdrawal. You know, there's something about knowing that He's got you covered, and you're not you're not just you're not just giving money. He doesn't need your money. He needs your heart so that He can be in position to take care of you. And as the word says, goes on to say that He'll open up the windows and pour out a blessing that there's not room enough to contain. And then He goes on to say that he'll rebuke the devourer for your namesake. 
So if the enemy's coming to, to, to rob you in the area of finances, listen, this is one thing that you can, this is one habit that you can take up that the Lord will support giving. And he'll bless you through it every single time. Amen. So if you have your offering, you want to hold that up, we'll pray over it. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give back to you what already belongs to you. Lord, we thank you for Lord, we thank you for the privilege to serve you, to do your work, to partner with you in ministry. And Lord, we thank you that you've, that you've called us to be ministers of reconciliation, Father, to, to lift up your name, Father. And your word says that if we lift you up, that you will draw all men unto yourself. So, Father, we thank you that as we, as we navigate life partnered with you, Father, that just one area that we are choosing to trust you is in, the, in is the area of finances. Father, you can surely identify where our heart is by that. We trust you and we thank you and we're so grateful for you, Father. And Lord, we ask that you pour out a blessing upon every person that's sowing tonight into your kingdom. Lord, we ask that you open up the windows and pour out a blessing. There's not room enough to contain. And Lord, because you're faithful, to just show up and show out in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, we're going to continue on with our series. And it's called, uh, it's called, uh, it's called uh, Be the Change. Be the Change. Hallelujah. <laughs> Good thing you took notes, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm not the only one feeling a bit scattered today. <laughs> so I know that uh, I become acclimated to Idaho because I can go out in the morning and take out the dogs in 25 degree weather in shorts and a tank top and be totally fine. But then today I dress to come into town and I'm sitting in the car and I find myself being extremely irritable and I'm like, what is wrong with me? And it's just like mid 80s for those of you who didn't, uh, that uh, don't, aren't here in Pocatello and, uh. I was like in the direct sunshine in the car, and I'm, I'm like, I was so hot, I was sweating, and I was thinking, I did not dress appropriately, like this is not, I don't think I'm the same person that used to be able to run in 112 degree weather in the middle of August in Texas, so I'm like, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know, maybe I'm just uh, getting sissified, or I've just become <laughs> acclimated to Idaho, and I, I love, actually, that's one of the things that I really, really love about uh, Idaho is the climate. It's what I, I know everybody's like, oh, it's so freaky. Like it's 25 in the morning and 80 in the afternoon. And I love that. I love that it changes often. And that's one of the things, I mean, Texas was hot. It was hot, hotter and hottest. And I mean, that was just how it was or, you know, and so I've uh, learned to love the differences, the changes in the weather, the environment, the climate. So let's go ahead and pray and get started. So Father God, we just thank you for tonight. We thank you for your word. We especially thank you for your anointing that comes to break the yoke of bondage. We thank you that you are faithful to meet us, no matter if we're feeling irritable or scattered Lord, that we're earthen vessels, but we're yielded to you and your spirit. We thank you that you have your way here tonight. I thank you that you use my eyes and my ears and my words that came from you. My gestures, my posture. Lord, let it be to your glory. We thank you for your faithfulness. This is not about me. This is about you. And we're here to stand in your presence to be the change in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So, um, last week we started, and we started talking. I just did kind of an overview of what we're going to be going over the next couple of weeks. So, I'm going to just kind of skim some of the major points um, the first point, well, number one, we were talking about the things that are going on in the world today, that there are a lot of different things. It's not just one thing. There, there are several things. Not only that, but they're back-to-back-to-back to back to back disaster. 
And actually, if you follow any kind of local news, then there was another disaster that is kind of unveiling right now, like as we speak in the present. And so there are these things that are going on in our world consistently. And we're plugged in. I mean, we are over-informed and unaware a lot of the time. We have so much information. We can know right now what's going on. Danica has a sweet friend that lives in Hawaii, and we talk with her often. We can know right now what's going on in Hawaii. We can know, remember with the baby giraffe, when the baby, everybody was waiting for the baby giraffe to be born? I mean, I don't even know what state that was in, but it wasn't in the state that I lived at the time. I don't even know if I was in Texas or Idaho at the time, but everybody was watching this giraffe for this baby giraffe to be born. Like, we have access to so much stuff. I can real time go on right now at Pebble Creek and know the people that are up there with their webcams. I can go on to, you know, any of these resorts. My my younger sister, she's in Colorado right now, and she was at the Garden of the Gods. And I can go to any of those ski resorts and look at their ski cams and see the people there and see what's going on. And we have real time information at our fingertips all the time. And it's so funny because I can find myself, and I do this all the time. So I was sitting in, um, in my quiet time spot, and I had, we have a new kitten, and then I have my old lady dog, and she's tiny. So she always sits on my lap in the, not, in the evening and in the mornings when, uh, during my quiet time, and then at night when I'm kind of winding down. Well, the kitten is new. She's new to the family, and um, Evie doesn't like other animals. She thinks she's a people, so she does not know that she's a dog. And so here's this little kitten biting Evie's ears. And Evie's not having it. She's just like, no. So she's like smacking the cat, and she's like growling at the cat. But she's like four pounds. I mean, the cat probably weighs more than her already, and she's only a couple weeks old. And um, anyways, the cat jumps on the dog's back, and the dog starts rolling. And then they're rolling and rolling and rolling. And all I can think of is this video my sister showed me. And then she would make me watch it every time I saw her. It was, a um, what was it? Baby pig? Baby monkey. There's a little baby monkey riding on a pig. So every time I would see my sister, she showed me this YouTube video. And it was this little monkey riding on a pig, and it was just running around. And I was like... Why are you showing me this? But then every time she showed me, I would laugh my face off. And so then she would show it to me again, and she would just, like, show it to me over and over. And then she'd show Marcus, and she'd show Danica, and she'd show Doug. And I'm like, stop showing me the video. But then I caught myself later on watching this stupid video. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? But it, it was, like, I think that that's the kind of world that we live in. We find something that makes us happy for a minute, We remember the experience or the response that we had, and then we repeat it, and we repeat it, and we repeat it. I can watch the stupid video right here in front of God and everybody, and I would probably cry or snort or do something really stupid because it would make me laugh so hard, not just like the video itself, but just the experience behind it, like, and I think that's how we live most of the time. I think most of the time... We spend a lot of times reenacting experiences that were good and trying to avoid or stay away from experiences that were bad. And I think that we live kind of this unbalanced reality, and then we kind of throw God in the middle of it. And I think that during times like this, when we have compounded Disaster after disaster after tragedy after, you know, all of these wild, mind-blowing issues. They're hard, hard issues. They're crisis. They're tragedy. They're trauma. They really are. They're hard issues. They're not easy issues. They're not shallow, you know, trendy talk. Like, let's talk about what boots are on sale or, you know, it's not about what hairstyle's real cute right now. I mean, they're hard issues. They're real-life issues. And you can't go anywhere without thinking about them or seeing them or them being in your face or you being confronted with them. You can't go to the supermarket. And you can't go to the gas station. You can't go to your job. You can't, you can't even go hang out with your friends without having all of these hard issues right in the middle of your reality. And last week I shared 
some of uh, my experience with just one particular kind of experience with authority. I have many run-ins with authority. <laughs> that was just one or two maybe if they're tied together. But, um, and, but then I was thinking about another experience that I had had. Let me first go over the four different uh, sections of this series that I feel like God said. Number one, I felt like he said, get quiet. Number two, recognize and believe that God is who he says that he is and that he'll do what he says that he'll do. That is a true definition of faith. And therefore, it is really important that we understand that. Number three, recognize and believe who God has made us to be. Not just us as people, but us as individuals. Like So many times I feel like uh, people think that they have to lose their individuality that they have to fit in. Doug, can we, he's a good witness to this, but like um, when we first started dating and then like things started to get serious and we started to look at stuff, Doug loved like suburban life. He loved living in suburbia with a nice little landscape yard and, and I, I couldn't even stomach to go into the suburbs. Like, I had such a hard time. I'm like, I don't want a cookie cutter life. Like, I can't, like, I, I just fought so hard. I didn't want to be like everybody else. And I had this image of what everybody else lived like. They work Monday to Friday, eight to five, you know, and they went to their little jobs and they were all perfect and all their life was perfect and their families were perfect. And, you know, and they had this perfect little life and everything was great. And, and Doug actually had kind of a model life before we met <laughs> that was similar. He, you know, he says, like, when we got together, he kind of had a put-together life on the outside. And I had a completely falling apart life. And I didn't care. I really didn't. I wasn't trying to fit any kind of mold. And actually, the truth was, I went out of my way to break molds. Like, if you try to put me in this mold, broken stomped on, and it, it really was rebellion, but it's a good example of what my ideas of, like, a real life or normal life was. I mean, like, when I, I used to call people, this is so terrible, but I used to call people weekenders that would come and do fun things at the place where I did fun things at. Like, oh, they're weekenders because they have a normal life. You know, they, from Monday to for Friday, 8 to 5, you know, they have a normal life. They've got their 2.5 kids, their dog, their cat, their three, you know, car garage and living in the suburbs and they had nice landscaping and, and they had a perfect life. They went and got their hair done and their nails done and, you know, they just, they shopped at the, the you know, brand store and, or the designer stores and, they just had, they were, they were normal. And there were those people and then there were me. And I didn't fit in. And then there was a few other people that I knew that didn't fit in. And that's why we were all friends and, you know, I could hang out with those people because they're not normal. Normal people, they're scary. They try to make you be something. They try to make you do something. After I got saved, it was really hard to fight off the idea of being normal. We weren't created to be normal. And what is normal anyway? What are you going to do, take an average of the people? I mean, come on, look around. You know what I'm saying? Like, what is normal? There are people that live in multi-million dollar mansions, and there are people that are struggling to even keep, you know, gas in a car to get from one place to another, or even that, just to have a tent to be able to have a warm place to to sleep at night. And so like, why, why did I choose to believe that was normal? That that idea was normal? Because that was my reality. My experience was to always fight for this certain lane of being normal. But when God finally got a hold of my heart, I didn't know who I was. I didn't want to be normal. But if that meant having a better life, then, you know, from the past that I had come from, I was willing to give that up. And when he handed me the life 
that was meant to have, and I finally received it. It was anything but normal. There's nothing normal about it. When I found out that he loved all my tiny little quirks and my crazy little hang-ups, and my, he, that he loved all of these things about me, and not that he wanted me to keep them, mind you, but that he loved everything about me. That he took all of the good, the good and he took all of the bad and he loved it all the same because it was me. It was my life and he loved me, not the things that I was doing. When we come to a place of recognizing and believing who God made us to be, we break the mold of normal in our thinking. We get out of the lane of comparison. We stop living a life of covetedness and absolute aggravation because you never have enough or you always have too much. It's never good enough, never clean enough, never broken enough. Whatever it is, the enemy always uses it to compare to somebody else. And you never just love being you. So that's going to be weak, the, the third part. The fourth part is what your part is. Learning how to do your part. To be the change. So this week we're going to focus on get quiet. And so I was talking about kind of like all of the things that are going on in the world. I'm going to drink a lot of water. I have a really, really dry throat. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we were talking about all the things that have been going on recently. But do you know, like, there's nothing new under the sun. I want to talk about 18 years ago, a little over 18 years now. And it was September 3rd. And I was standing in front of a television, and I was almost full-term pregnant with Marcus. And I watched live news with an airplane crash into Tower 2 on 9-11 in Twin Towers. And I stood there paralyzed in fear. I stood there because I had another human being inside of my body. And I had no idea what the world was going to be like when he got here. And he was, it was almost time. He was actually born exactly a month later. I hated the thought that I would bring a child into this world. From a very young age, I was told I wouldn't be able to have children, so I lived my life accordingly. And I made a mess. I made a mess of everybody, myself included, obviously, but I did not live a life that would say I thought of anybody else but myself. I really didn't. I say that I did, but it was only to keep people around me because I was selfish and I wanted people around me. I wanted to know that I wasn't alone and I need, they needed me, and therefore I would use them to keep them around me. And we talked a lot about this last week because this was my reality. And I based my reality on the facts that my life had been based on. And at that point, I wasn't supposed to be able to have children. The facts were that if I ever did have a child, I would never be able to carry full term. And if I did carry full term, that that child would be extremely screwed up. I had no prenatal care because I was absolutely in fear. Midway through my um, pregnancy, I had thought that I miscarried and I refused to go to the hospital because I hated the thought of a doctor or anybody else touching me. And so I, I lived in this bubble that I created. And it was my reality. I was God of my world, but now I carried this other human being. And now there's terrorists in the world. And it was a reality that I had a choice. And I'll tell you, the choices I made after that were not very um, selfless. They were very selfish. And for many, many years after that, I continued on being a very selfish, self-centered, very much manipulative, controlling person. I created my world. I stood Lord over my life, and I was very proud of that. You know, you hear self-made men. They, you know, a lot of times men will say, "I'm self-made." Well, I prided my, I made, I made and boasted 
that I had made who I was, and I did not mind the person that I was. And I was very hateful. And I, at night, I did not sleep well. And that's the truth. Unless sedated, which was often. And so I led a life of addiction, control, manipulation. And I don't stand up here saying that pridefully. There's been years of reconciliation that have had to take place in order for me even to share a lot of those things. I remember walking the trash out one time. We were living around the same area where I had ruined a lot of people. And I was part of this mother's group, and I had gotten saved, but I was in this not so much small town anymore, but people knew. It's kind of like Pocatello, like, you know, if you did some bad, buddy's going to know. And that's kind of how it felt because we grew up there. I grew up in that town. People knew who I was. They knew my parents. They knew, you know, kind of, uh, they just knew. They knew the family. They knew my brothers and sisters. My brother and sister, they knew my friends. And uh, but I had created this life. And I felt led to share a testimony about a certain level of addiction that I had, you know, experienced and encountered. And I had shared in this ladies' group. And one of the guys, he, um, his wife was there, and he, the guy worked with my daddy. My cousin's third cousin removed. <laughs> he was my, he, they, he was a co-worker with my dad's. And I had shared some very, very personal, private, very transparent information about myself. And I walked, and I was walking to the trash can, and I'm just so I'm mad, and I'm crying at the same time. I'm so mad because I'm like, why did I even share that? That was the dumbest thing I could have ever done. This is going to get back. People are going to know. I'm never going to be able to make a good life for myself. And all of these things that I'm working so hard to be able to do to make this new reality for myself. And I was mad at God because I'm like, God, why did you make me share that? You asked me to share that. And it's like, why did you have me to share that? Because now these people are going to know, and they're never going to be able to look at me the same way. They know this about me now. And they'll never be able to unsee the things that they just saw in their mind. And I didn't hear God then. I didn't hear him on that walk. I was just so mad. I mean, I was so mad. I went over and kicked There's the big trash receptacle. I kicked it over. I'm carrying a dirty diaper. Like, like I'm such an idiot because now I have to clean it up. <laughs> I'm just mad, and I didn't hear anything from God about it. I didn't, I just, it was just silence, and I was, you know, I just had all this turmoil and this anger, this bitterness on the inside of me, like, why are you so stupid to have done that to begin with? Beating myself up. Why did you ever do that, Teresa? Why did you ever do that? But then you shared it. Why would you ever tell anybody in your life about this? Why? They didn't know. They didn't need to know. Nobody knew. Why did you tell them? And so, like, I finally, obviously, I have to go back into the house, and I kind of calmed down, but it never really, it always kind of settled in the back of my mind, like, it's going to come out. Because that had been the reality that I had lived up until that point. Like, it's going to come out. We're going to, somebody, somebody's going to know about this. They're going to, um, how do you say, kick me out of the church. Like, excommunicate, kick me out. Shut the door on me. Like, when they find out these things, they're going to, they're going to be done with me. Everybody. Doug included. We weren't married at the time. No, no, maybe we were. Yeah. We were. Because I was in a mother's group already. So, I'm like, if anybody, when they find out, I'm just going to go back to the way my life was before. This is all just an illusion anyway. You just, they're, everybody's being nice to you because you're putting on this happy face in front of people. Although I never wore a happy face because I have like, I wear my heart on my sleeve. Like everything that I do, is, it's like, it's a book. I'm an open book. I've never been able to wear a face except for the faces that I put on, you know, into this point. And like, then I'm like, I just, I can't do it anymore. And I say all that to say this. Even once I had gotten saved, I still had a skewed idea of reality. 
I still had all the experiences, all the facts, all the things that I had from my life, and I was bringing those into my reality. Although I was trying to understand how my pastors could stand up there and tell me, this is the truth of the word of God. This is going to change your life. Get this in. This is what changes everything. Get this inside of you. And step for step, I started to learn the truth of God and who he made me to be. But it was through a lot of noise. It was through a lot of noise. One time, we joke about this every once in a while, but I I think we were just laying on the couch or something, and Doug said, what are you thinking about? And I said, oh, Jesus, you do not want to know. Like, I couldn't even tell you all the things that I'm thinking about. And my mind just ran a thousand miles a minute, but hardly nothing came out here until I got into a certain, you know, position where emotions just made me either I, I, it was all love and everything came out or it was all hate and everything came out or, you know, something had to happen in order to get everything to come out. But at the same time, it was all still going on right here. There was like all of this stuff. And uh, he called it purple chalk. Here's eraser. Just erase it. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start erasing all of the things that are just running through my mind. I feel like the Lord asked me to, to kind of title this, if you want to say, get quiet, not be quiet. Because you can keep your mouth shut 90, 100% of the time and not be quiet. I love, Mar- I didn't ask permission from Marcus to share this, but <laughs> when he was younger and he was first started being able to ride on the back of a motorcycle, so he would ride with my baby brother, and I'm telling you, I would be, I'd get so nervous. Well, he'd ride with Doug every once in a while, and then uh, I'd get so nervous because we would go for these long rides, like an hour, two hour ride. And we're on the street. You're like, not, we're not talking about trails or anything. We're talking about on the interstate, on the highway, you know, sometimes back roads, but still. And this kid would fall asleep on the back of the motorcycle. Fall asleep. Fall asleep. Yes, he would. But the reason why is because we live in such a world that we are constantly bombarded. And we have to make a choice to stop it. We have to make a a choice, a conscious decision to turn it off. We have to make a conscious choice on what comes in and what we choose to stay. One of my classic... Uh, one of my classic maneuvers was um, I would get a thought and it'd just be a single thought. Then all of a sudden, I would be like four years later in my mind and I had played out the thought for, you know, three hours because I have this vivid imagination. And then I, like, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. What is going on with my life? Like, that has nothing to do with my life. What am I doing? I'm just thinking about all of these things. And it would start off with something so simple and something so, like, minute. And I wouldn't even realize it. And it would be, like, hours later, and I'm still thinking about it. And it's built on. It wasn't like it was just the same thought. It was built upon. I'll I'll give you an example. So um, our mailbox was right by the road. It was a dirt road. And so Marcus used to go get the mail. And it was his job, his chore. And so... Like I would, I could, I'd say, okay. And he'd say, mommy, I can go myself. And I'd say, okay, you can do that. But I don't watch out the side window so I could see him. And then, so I would have this, so I would watch him go and he would come back. But then sometimes in my mind, I would see him getting hit by a car. And then I can see me standing there, you know, crying over his body. And then I could see me 10 years later at what was supposed to be his graduation, crying, and I'm standing at the window and I'm crying because I had just had all of these thoughts and the kid was just running to the mailbox and he ran back. And I would just be this absolute nervous wreck all the time. The kid hit his head on everything anyway. 
Seriously. So anything, I always took it to the extreme. So sometimes he would fall, and then I would imagine that the kid had brain damage, and then I'd have to feed him, like, for the rest of his life. And then he was an adult that had to have been fed, and, like, would I be able to be that kind of mom? Would I be strong enough to do that? Would I have to change his diaper? Could I hire somebody? I mean, I'm talking about these full-blown imaginations, and they were, they were sick. That's, that is sick. And so I would just sit and I would realize, and this is years after I got saved. I was like, oh my God, I don't think that this is the way you want me to live my life. I don't think that you want me to have my reality so skewed that I live so much in my head and a little bit on the outside, but then there's no real meeting point. Like where the two come together. Like in my mind, I was like this powerful anointed preacher, but then I couldn't stand up in front of anybody and talk, except for like a couple of people. And then of course, I'm just doing my best to make them laugh because I feel like an idiot. And I'm just like, just say whatever you have to. And then I say really dumb stuff. And then I felt really dumb and I never wanted to do it anymore. I'm like, no, I'm not doing that anymore. But then I would have these like great imaginations about standing in front of thousands of people and sharing the gospel. And bringing all these people to Christ. And not because of me, but because, you know, because of the life that I lived. And now I give give glory to God. And so, like, (laughs) so it it was so, like, I was having such a hard time, like, bringing about what the reality was supposed to be. From the truth of the word. From the experience, but for, like, what reality was. So the key is learning how to steal your mind and your heart to be able to hear from the Holy Spirit. There are ideas that God would give me, and then I would run away with them. But vain, vain, vain imaginations. But then there were other things that the enemy would give me, and it would keep me so distracted from anything that God would have for me that I... Um, I would be hours of my mind just in a different place. And I would escape. And it was, a, it was the same kind of life that I had lived before, just kind of repackaged because I lived a life of kind of uh, making up my reality and believing it to be a certain way, even though it really wasn't that way. And so I would escape when anything real hard came around. So I'd escape into dope, I would escape into pets, I would escape into other things, attention, whatever, it, you know, presented itself. And so, like, it was the same escapism that had came over with me to my Christian walk. And I lived this way for a long time. But then there was a few things that we, we had to confront hard things up front. And so when those hard things would come, just press through the hard stuff and be like, okay, I'm getting to the other side. And when this is over, this is over. You know what I mean? But it was always just about getting, getting over with it. Just get over with it. Just like with that idea about when I shared at that mom's meeting. Oh, well, here it is. Just expose me for who I am. Let's just get it over with. No one ever exposed me. And actually, I had several testimonies. One very in particular that was super, super personal of a lady's past and that she had been living with suicidal thoughts because of the past that she had lived. And she said, I would have never shared if I had not known some of the things that you had experienced. So I started allowing deep things to be surfaced. But with those came dealing with deep things. Because when you... You bring deep things up, real things surface, real emotions, real imaginations, and your mind gets busy if you you don't uh, allow the Holy Spirit to guide you through it. But you'll never be able to get to a place where you can quiet your mind or your heart if you deny the Holy Spirit access. And that's what we do. When we escape the hard things, I think the reason why we are seeing people respond the way they are right now in the world that we live in is because we've been allowed to live a shallow life for the most part. All the normal people, which is no one, 
We have our small talk. We talk about our kids. We talk about our job. But when it starts to get to hard things, we isolate. And we create our own, our own reality. We bring into it and we talk about God's word as if it's something that's part of it. But the truth is, is all we're really bringing in is the experience. And then we're trying to kind of, uh, our family uses like sauce on everything, like any kind of sauce, like cream gravy. Like you cannot have chicken strips or chicken nuggets without cream gravy. Like that's just one of the things. It's like a necessity. You can't have like French fries without ketchup. And now that we're from Idaho, Mar fry sauce only the good kind not that garbage but or ranch <laughs> so, so <laughs> but so what we try to do is we try to throw in the word of god every once in a while as our little dipping sauce and we take our reality which is mostly communed of our experience the facts and then we kind of dip it in the truth a little bit and that's what we try to feed other people but then they're just getting a skewed version of us. And then we don't understand why the world doesn't understand what, you know, who Jesus really is. But we're giving them a chicken nugget dipped in the wrong sauce. We're just giving them a piece that we want to give people. And I'm not saying go, go out and give everybody all your goods. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying we'll never get to a place of knowing who we are if we continue to live in a place that we allow ourselves to be busy and distracted and never get quiet and hear the truth about who God is and who he's made us to be and the issues that we're really dealing with. So I'm going to, this is a song that was just released not too long ago. It says, I don't want to be on my phone, but I can't be alone. Welcome to the modern way. Trying to be somebody I'm not, but it's not what I want. Tell me there's another way. All of the lights I chased for now faded. All the cheap thrills were only time wasted. Tell me why society's plan should define who I am. Surely there's a higher way. All my best friends are sick of pretending. We want the truth. So much is missing, so give us the real thing. I know it's you. I don't want a stereotype to decide who I am. It never knew me anyway. I'm over trying to find the hype, the next hype, because the high never lasts. I'm going to go another way. All the lights that I chased are now faded. Dylan was right. The times, they are changing. Tell me why society's plans should define who I am. Surely, there's a higher way. If we want people to want what we have, we're going to have to choose a higher way. We're going to have to learn how to get quiet. We're going to have to learn how to deal with the hard things. And we're going to have to learn how to get over the idea of being normal. It's such a facade. It's such a smoke and light show. Nobody wants that. When it comes to having to dealing with hard things over and over and over and over, listen, that's not what they want. They want the truth. They want the truth of where you are and what God's done for you personally. Not what you know or what you can quote, but what you're living right now. What's your struggle that you're working through? Or the answer to the struggle that they're working through that you've gotten victory in. They want to know that they're not just coming to a place to be set up on a podium and judged and talked about, and just waiting for the next time when something is exposed that nobody's going to ever want to come near them again because it's just too bad. Or maybe there isn't anything bad in your past. And maybe that's not exciting enough because we live in such a drama-filled world that God forbid that you have a testimony that, you, that the Lord kept you. Most of the days, nobody, nobody except for Jesus can say all the days, most of the days of your life. I'm going to read out of 1 Timothy. Actually, I'm going to read all of 1 Timothy 1. This is, I love the letters to Timothy because this is Paul, the Apostle Paul, 
And he is addressing Timothy, which is his disciple. Timothy is now a leader in the church of Ephesus. So he is now in a position where he's leading other people. That's every single one of us. And there's nobody in here that doesn't have influence into somebody. I love it because he addresses some of the things that are really important to a leader. Now, Timothy was born, his mom was a Jew and his dad was Greek. So he was born kind of the best of two worlds. So he knew a lot about culture, but he also knew a lot about the law. And so when he and Paul, when they teamed up in the early ministries of the Apostle Paul, Paul just was connected to this kid. And so these letters are his heart to him when he wasn't able to be there to walk side by side. And I want you to hear this from a position and a place of someone that has walked out a lot of hard things. To know we're walking side by side. There's a higher way. We're going to go that higher way with you. So 1 Timothy 1, this is in the New Living Translation. It tells us this letter is from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, appointed by the command of God, our Savior, and Christ Jesus who gives us hope. I'm writing to Timothy, my, my true son in the faith. May God the Father and Christ Jesus, our Lord, give you grace, mercy, and peace. When I left for Macedonia, I urged you to stay there in Ephesus and stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. Don't let them waste their time in endless discussions about myths and spiritual pedigrees. These things only lead to meaningless speculations which don't help people live a life of faith in God. Come on, I know you guys can hear this. The purpose of my instruction is that all believers will be filled with love that comes from a pure heart. Not people that say they love. Not people that say they care. But that they live from a place of a pure heart, a clear conscience, and genuine faith. I think that I love the Lord more and more every day because it's always been a genuine relationship. From the point, like, where I surrendered my life, I'm just like, well, ain't nothing hidden from you, God. And this is what my pastor, I love my, our pastor, when she was, she was in the room while I was giving birth to Danica. And she said, well, there's nothing that hadn't been unearthed now. I... I'm saying there is a genuine place of faith that has a clear conscience and a pure heart that love comes from. It's not not just about what we say. It's about how we believe. But some people have missed this whole point. They've turned away from these things and they spend their time in meaningless discussions. Holy Jesus, let's talk about Facebook, right? I won't even, okay, outside the buy, sell trades, I won't lie. Outside (laughs) and the funny videos, well, that's, (laughs) they don't get, they're not allowed to get political. You get kicked off in there. (laughs) Listen, politics are important. We live in a country that we have the opportunity to have a voice and we should use it. This is not about being quiet. This is about learning how to get quiet. We spend all of our time in meaningless discussion here. Oh, I was the best, especially in junior high. I'm serious. Like, so, so, like, um, I hung out with some of these girls, and they were a little bit of bullies. But then I also hung out with some of the preppy girls. And so sometimes I would get caught in between. And I'm like, oh, wait until, like, such and such is within such and such. And I'm going to say this. And then I'm going to be like queen of the cafeteria. And then they'll say something, and then I'll just stand there looking stupid, and I didn't say it. And then for the whole rest of the day, I was just thinking in my mind, I could have said this, or I could have said that. Or when she said this, I could have said that. The meaningless discussions that we're talking about is not just the discussions that we're having with other people. It's more so the discussions that are going on on the inside of us. 
We're spending all of our time with our mind wrapped up on all of these things. And it's keeping us so distracted that we cannot hear. We cannot hear. It's the smoke and lights. And all of a sudden, we're going down a path, and we don't even know how we got there. But here we are. They want to be known as teachers of the law of Moses. Or you could just say, they want to be known for the knowledge they had, for the information. The law of Moses were the things that were brought forward, the things that would make them clean on the exterior. But Jesus came to fulfill that law. So these people are wanting to be known for all the things that they know. 22 Bible verses that you can recite? Well, that makes me an expert. No. But I live in such a way that I treat people like garbage. I make ugly comments about people that have different occupations. I'm hateful to my children. Hush your face. They want to be known as the teachers of the law of Moses, but they don't know what they're talking about, even though they speak with confidence. We know that the law is good when it's used correctly. Come on, anybody with some church hurt? For the law was not intended for people who do not do what is right. It is for the people who are lawless and rebellious, who are ungodly and sinful, who consider nothing sacred and defile what is holy, who kill their, their father and their mother or commit other murders. The law is for people who are sexually immoral or have, who practice homosexuality or are slave traders, liars, promise keepers, or promise baker, breakers, or who do anything else that contradicts the wholesome teaching that comes from glorious good news, or you could say the gospel, entrusted to me by our blessed God. The law is put into place so that people who are living outside of God's way of doing things can recognize they're outside of God's way of doing things. It's not to regulate the believer. We need to be set free. We want to check off our Christian goody list as we're checking off other people's for them as well. But he's saying, this is not good news. This is not gospel. You have been, you're over in meaningless discussions in your mind because you have been swept away in your mind by thinking that somehow you're going to be good enough to earn God and his love. When it's already been received as a free gift, it's something you already have. You've already received it. The... uh, I thank Christ. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength to do his work. He considered me trustworthy and appointed me to serve him, even though I used to blaspheme the name of Christ. In my insolence, I persecuted his people. Earthen vessel yielded. His past that was his reality. He killed people. The Apostle Paul, before his conversion, outright murdered Christians. People that now God sent to him too. But God had mercy on me because I did did this in my ignorance and unbelief. Oh, how generous and gracious our Lord was. He filled me with faith and love that come from Christ Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I love, this is mine. You can't, like says, don't add to. But I'm saying not to point out their sin. The law was put into place so that people knew when they were doing things that were outside of God's will or his nature or his, you know, his ability, not his ability, his nature, his character, his will, his plan. It was put into place so people could recognize it. Not so that we can share it with each other about how so-and-so is doing this. Look how terrible they are. They must not love Jesus. It was not what it was contended for. 
and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. You see how he used him as an example so he could have patience with a sinner? Not so that he could go and remind him just because he knows all of the inside information. Remember the experience I shared? The love of Christ will bring people to you. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And I lived in anxiety and fear of that testimony for so long until I found out my dear sweet friend had came from something so much more horrid and ugly than I had ever experienced. And she only shared it. Now we have the opportunity to pray for one another, not because I talked to her about her past, or that I can talk to her about my past, but because of the love of Jesus as an example of what he could do through a yielded vessel. Then others will realize that they too, they can believe in him and receive eternal life. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen who, has, who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Timothy, my son, here are my instructions for you based on the prophetic words spoken about you earlier. May they help you fight. May they help you fight well in the Lord's battle. Cling to your faith in Christ and keep your conscience clear. For some people have deliberately violated their conscience. As a result, their faith has been shipwrecked. And he gives an example here that are are two people. They got thrown and handed over to Satan. First Timothy 2, starting in verse 1. He continues on to say, I urge you first of all. And I love this because I almost feel like it's a response, like how to do it. I urge you first of all, pray for all people. You know, the funniest thing about that word all, you can look it up in any translation. All. All people. People who choose to do wrong, who will never choose to do right. All people. People who think they're too good to ever do wrong. That was a hard one for me to learn how to love. All people, ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way, and now listen carefully. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peacefully and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. You want to know why we're in such upheaval? Mm, This is going to hurt. We choose to talk about our authority rather than pray for them, rather than intercede for them. You know, I never knew the kind of pressure that could come upon a person. I've always had leadership positions my whole life, whether I earned them or whether I manipulated to have them or whether they were something that were genuinely given to me by God. I had a lot of different leadership positions, but I've never in my life had to deal with the kind of pressure that comes when you've been entrusted with God's people. And understanding now the kind of pressure that falls back on my spiritual authority and my leaders and the leadership that trained me. Actually, one of our generals of faith, he graduated. And I'll tell you, I I cried for like a second, but I'm telling you, the man lived such a life that was such a great example and loved people and lived quietly. Now, it doesn't mean that he wasn't bold. This is a bold man of faith who stepped out in healing, uh, what do you call it when they're big? Um, Crusades, healing crusades with thousands of people coming to know the love of Christ, receiving healing instantly in other countries, Nicaragua, Scotland, Ireland, all of these places. This man was not quiet, but he lived a quiet life. He lived in peace. We watched his example of us as we were falling apart just saved. I mean, just a stinking wreck. I can't even tell you how much of a wreck we were. 
just a wreck and just loved us and loved us well. He graduated to heaven yesterday or the day before yesterday, but... And I'm telling you, all I can do in my heart is say, thank you, Lord, for giving me examples of what spiritual authority is supposed to look like. And don't let me look like anything else. Don't ever let me look like anything else. If I get over looking like something else, Lord, let me see. Let me have eyes. Let my heart hear. Let me get quiet and hear you. wasn't because somebody preached the Bible at me. The man lived a beautiful life in front of me. I watched him walk through so many hardships, and he watched us and walked us through many. We live life together, genuine, sincere. Not how's the weather, T? It's great, but let me tell you about what the Lord is doing in my health right now. Let me tell you about what the Lord is doing in my finances right now. Let me tell you what God is doing in my kids right now. Holy Jesus, that is prophetic. Hallelujah. I'm serious. It's time for us to stop giving people the chicken nugget with ketchup. They're looking for the truth. They're looking how to maneuver this stuff. But if we can't ever figure it out, how are they? live in the center of Pocatello right where we did with no backyard I mean they had a backyard but praise God that we had a place to stay but Lord Jesus there was no quiet place ever there's no there was no AC you had to live with the windows open I love my parents I mean I love our our neighbors but Lord I got more contact high there than I did in high school I mean it was it was noisy it was busy it was wild but the, I, we had to find a place how to get quiet right in the middle of the busy, right in the middle of all the noise, right in the middle of distraction, right in the middle of physical pain, emotional pain, right in the middle of, of being uncomfortable and unsure and insecure, right in the middle of all of it. We had to learn how to get quiet. We had people around us that showed us a beautiful example we got to make a choice. we got to say there's more than this. I love the lights. I love the media. I love the fellowship. I love playing pool. I like, you know, bonfires. I like having potlucks. But I love seeing people win. I love people being able to do hard things. I'm going to brag on Danica Ray. I don't even know if she's in here. I made her do so many hard things today. I probably, like, back to back to back. Because here's the thing. I'm not just raising any kid. I am raising frontline battlefield people. I love them. They're my children. I don't want to ever see them hurt. But at the same time, that girl needs to have some muscles. And she needs some grit. And she needs to know how not to quit. And she needs to know how to walk into the middle of a situation and how not to just control it, but how to get quiet. And how to not be overcome by fear, anxiety, stress, insecurity, or being uncomfortable. We need to learn how. We need to learn how that when hard things come, stop backing down. I'm going to close. Pray this way. Pray this way for kings and for all who are in authority so that we can live peacefully in quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. I'm not going to call you out, but how many of you even know the name of the mayor? Our governor. Well, now we do because it's all over because of, thank God for COVID because now we know everybody in positions, right? But how many times is that person's name in our mouth when it has nothing to do with the name of Jesus? Well, Governor Little, he said this, this, and this, and this. Well, that's great, but here's what I said. I'm in the blood of Jesus. I'm in the blood of Jesus over his mind and his decision making. And I thank you that his eyes are open. His revelation knowledge. He comes to 
to know you in a personal way. As a seal upon my arm, for there is love that is as strong as death. Our house of jealousy demanding as the grave. We have so many waters cannot quench this love. authority so that we can live peacefully and quiet lives walk by godliness and dignity. This is good and it pleases God our Savior who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. He didn't say no to the truth. You, you see, he didn't say no to the truth. He said understand the truth. You want to know what's the difference between knowing and understanding applications? When you understand Something, you'll follow through. When you understand God as your provider, tithe is not even something you have to be able It's something that you believe in, know to be the truth. You understand it. You see it. No matter what your father has in your life. You're introducing someone to the truth. The truth. When you have the truth and you believe it and you understand it, it's not about convincing someone otherwise. You're just sharing with them what's happened to you. Let me tell you about my experience at Texas Roadhouse. Oh, that's easy to share now, isn't it? You know the server over there? Chelsea Ann? That girl's straight attitude. And do you know her fingernails were broken? Come on, Google review, Welp. We want to share our experience about everything except for when it comes to telling the truth. It's important for us to learn how to get to a place where we can get quiet on the inside and learn how to do hard things like share the gospel with people that are hostile or could possibly reject the gospel that we have to share with them and walk away unscathed. Not to take it personal. Well, they weren't ready. At least there's a seed planted. Hallelujah. I remember one time that we came back from a rally and Marcus is an evangelist at heart. He, the kid loves to talk. He loves to share. He's very good at sharing the truth. 
we came back from this motorcycle rally, and so you're literally sharing with hundreds of people the gospel message over several days. I mean, you're walking up to people like in bikinis, or you're walking up to straight, you know, black tie, you know, all different kinds of people, all different kinds of people, all different places, like all different kind of arena and areas of life. And so we get back to our hometown in Bastrop, and I, we were out of milk or something. And so we would go pick up the little boy I babysit. And so um, there was a dollar, what is it, Dollar General? Dollar General. That was right there where the school was, where I'd go pick up Nathan. So we get out, and everybody would go in because they'd have fun little dollar bins and stuff. And it's kind of like a little field trip, you know, homeschoolers. We had no life. Devotion. So we would get out. And we would get out of dollar bins. Like you're no, not I want you to pray for me, blah, 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 blah. you know. Blank, I want to look blank. right at Marcus you. Marcus walked away. And I like want to sing puppy. right to him. you. And, I mean, he couldn't have been probably Danica's age, maybe 13, 14 at the time. And so I looked at him, son, and I said, why did you share? Why did you go pray for that guy? I said, did you share with him or did you go pray with, try to pray for him because he was yelling at his kid? Or did you go and pray for him because you felt like God asked you to? I felt like God asked me to pray for him. I don't know why he wouldn't let me pray for him. Because he can't stop you from praying for him. So we stopped and we prayed for him. I said, you did what God asked you to do. You were just looking for an instant result. That's not how life really is. Doing hard things sometimes mean not seeing the result right then. You place the stars in when you get quiet, you have a clear conscience. You know you did what God asked you to do. You don't struggle with it. I mean, you struggle you with it. You called to the light. It you came life. into place. You're an absolute stranger. That broken people, they just break other people. Every detail of our beings you created. We don't know about that guy, where he is, where his life is like. Like a good father, you That's will take care. With courage, you're a very angry father. If you can pray for him, we don't know where he's in his heart. We'll never know if you're on the side of our You hold my knee. Marcus picked his head back up. We prayed for the man and his family. You wrap yourself around every detail of my to say no we just have a clear conscience and we know that we know that we know because we understand the truth it's time for us to give the world the truth chicken nuggets with ketchup eh? no thanks and I have chosen as a preacher and as an apostle to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth I'm not exaggerating I'm just telling the truth. Hallelujah. As Pastor Teresa was talking about, we had a uh, very dear friend, um, Paul Prestridge, who graduated to heaven the other day, and he was, uh, I don't know, he's, he was close to 80, I think. But he... Um, was one one of the most dynamic men that I've ever met. Really, I don't I don't even know the right words to put on it. But the guy was was absolutely amazing. And I remember when we were when we were young in our walk. You know, it wasn't that he would get up and he would just preach with these big words that would just impress everybody. You know what impressed me about this man? He believed 
what he said. He believed what he said. He lived what he preached. Every single day. Did he have struggles? Yeah, he did. Did he have opportunities to, to, to have bad days? Absolutely. But the guy lived what he said. And I think that's one of the big things is so many times we can. Let me just say this. I, my desire to preach a good message, to sound good, to win people over, not so much. Did I tap into the heart of the Father and did the anointing meet you and transform your life? You know, that's really at the end of the day, that's what's important. And it's not about preaching a message. You preach a message every single day. Sometimes uh, the, only, the only Bible that people are going to get is what they're seeing in you. Are we giving them the truth to make the change? Are we, are we, are we rising up to the standard to say no to things that, listen, this isn't God. Are we rising up to a place to just take a stand? You know, the, there was a song, you got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. It's the truth. You have to stand for the truth. And so, I mean, I went into a service. It was a youth service. And, man, I had every video and song and picture and everything for that to be amazing. By itself, it didn't need the anointing. It was going to be good. And I remember walking into that service, getting ready to, to minister to people that we love. And we had all this stuff lined out. And five minutes before, the computer, everything crashed. And I got ready to get up and preach. And it was about three minutes before I finally said, you know what? I'm just not going to have it tonight. So I got up there, and I stood up in front of all these people or all these youth, and I got up there to preach. And here's, what I, here, here's the decision that I made in my heart that night. I will never depend on lighting and media to bring the anointing. I'll never again wrap myself so much into something else to where I've got to have this, this, and this in order to carry the anointing. Listen, if you are, it's a distraction. I remember going into the county jail, and I went in one, man, I had prepared an amazing message for these guys. That was amazing. I know it was. And I got in there, and there were, there were, there were 13 guys in this, in this concrete room, which of those 13, I was probably the smallest one in there. And there's some big dudes in there. And, man, I got up there to preach, and I had this message, and I opened my notes up. Mike Boucher was there with me. I opened the notes up, and I'm like, it's going to be a good night. And I looked in at the notes. And as soon as I looked in at them, the Holy Ghost said, you're not preaching that tonight. I'm like, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> I don't have nothing else to preach. This is what we're preaching. Right? We can't leave here, right? And I'm up there getting ready to preach. And he said, no, no, no. He said, we're not preaching this tonight. And I begin to, uh, to transition over. And I begin to, you know, I preached on that night, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And there were 13 guys standing in there. And, I, and it was just, I mean, there was no priming the pump or in building each other. I said, if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, stand up where you are and lift your hands to heaven. And 12 of these guys stood up. And they began to walk up. And as I laid hands on I didn't get my hands on half of them. They began to pray in their heavenly language, one after another. And there was one guy that was sitting at the end of the line. He was still sitting down. The first guy came back, and he sat down next to him, and he received his heavenly language, and he, this guy looks over at him. And they sit there, and then another guy sits on the other side of him. He got his heavenly language. This guy looks over at him. And I'm thinking, my gosh. And all, by the time I got to the last person, this guy popped up. He walked up. He received it. So every single one of them there received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you know why I feel like we struggle with so many things in the world today because we walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. We walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. And I'm going to tell you the empowerment for every single believer 
to quiet this thing is in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It really is. It's in walking in a God-given supernatural ability that can be you. You know how hard it is to pray for people? That, did anybody ever pray? Anybody have a prayer list of people that you just cannot despise that you pray for before you pray for yourself? That's what I thought. Some of us might, right? But most of us, yeah, I got a prayer list and I can't find it in the trash can, right? But when you begin to allow the Spirit to pray through you, then what you, what you find is you, you tap into, oh, come on, somebody. A man of deep understanding will give good advice. Here's how. Drawing it out from the well within. The Spirit drawing it out from within. And when you pray in your heavenly language, it's pulling from that deep well. And it's drawing from that well. And you know the amazing thing about that well? When you pray in your heavenly language, you know the most amazing thing about it? You can't pray a selfish prayer. Because it's the Holy Spirit interceding for you with groanings that cannot be understood. You cannot pray a selfish prayer. So, just like now, things going on, well, how do you remain quiet in the midst of all this? Listen, there's a scripture that says, aspire to lead a calm and peaceful life as, your mind, as you mind your own business and earn your living just as we've taught you. By doing this, you will live an honorable life, influencing others and commanding the respect of even the unbelievers. You'll need be of nothing and not depend upon others. The way I want to close tonight is I'm going to stand right up here with this one right here next to me. We're going to turn the camera off once we make the call. If anybody in here tonight, and I know that every person in here is a believer, has not received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and we're giving you a call tonight and saying we want to pray with you to receive that gift. Because I'm telling you, you want to, you want to respond differently to circumstances. Your answer is within.